Dobar večer. Good evening, Mr. Kasparov. It's great to have you here. We are all really interested what you're going to say about chess and politics and the rest, if there is something else, of course, There's in this something world. else in between, yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so let us start. Um, it's about 5 p.m. just now. It's a bit late. So My was... apology for being late. So how many, how many games of chess did you play today? Today? Today. I, well, I signed many I, well, I signed many books, yes. Okay. <laughs> you yeah. see, I live in this deep conviction that uh, it must be an addiction. You know, when, if you are a chess player, if you are on the top for 20 years, then every single morning when you wake up, the first thing that you have to do, you have to lean over the chess board and do something. Um, but, uh, first of all, today, most of the chess players, they look at a computer screen rather than a chess board. <laughs> But uh, you should also not forget that I'm not uh, uh, I'm no longer a professional chess player. Sure. Uh, so I remember how to move the pieces, <laughs> but uh, if, if I want to think about the game, I don't need a board either. So yesterday I looked at the games played by these kids at the championship, so I uh, followed the game, especially those kids that I knew. Uh, and today my chess activity was so far zero. Okay. So I may still look at you know a screen when I'm back in the room, but it's unlikely. But I'm not sure that you should try to make chess sound like a drug. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah. But tell me something. You still do chess analysis a lot, I believe. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So how do you do that? How do you approach this task? Um, when I read the book. Uh, I definitely you know I just I go through the games, I look at the screen, I have chess engines, so that's the everybody that uses them now. Uh, that's pretty much it. So I'm not uh, I'm not doing the same quality analysis as I'm used to do sure. because I'm no longer playing professional chess. So it's uh, you should understand that your concentration level, unless you are playing and the um, professional game will not be the same. I mean, just, it's the, un un unlike you are in, in the midst of the battle, uh, your, um, uh, your ability to, uh, sorry, your vigilance will not be uh, at the same level. It's funny you say that because when there was this famous match between uh, Gelfand and Anand, I believe. Actually, it was this year. And it was interesting to follow the debate uh, after that because uh, you said that Anand uh, lost a bit of concentration and with concentration he lost a bit of precision and then everyone was going on, was Gary Kasparov right to say that? Uh, was he um, in a position to say that? Obviously, whatever you say, it's still extremely influential in the chess world. Look, you know, I think that we're all in a position to criticize each other. And after criticizing Putin, I feel free criticizing Anand. Uh, I think the game, his game today, nowadays, in the last few years, is a very, it's like a shadow of what I used to see 10, 20 years ago. I don't think there is anything wrong about saying the obvious. Um, I think it's, it's unacceptable when the world champion, somebody who carries a title, hasn't won a single chess event in four years. Uh, and it's clearly it's a result of him losing, first losing determination. Uh, uh, it's passion to play and to win, to make the difference. And then, of course, losing concentration because it all follows. Uh, I think it's sad. I, uh, you didn't see me saying such things about my former colleagues with great joy, but it's a fact. And, uh, and also, I think it's a little bit odd now that... Uh, the world champion and his challenger, you know, in the second decade of 21st century, they were over 40. The world is getting younger, the chess world is also getting younger, and you had the match, if you combine the age of two, two opponents, 42 and 43, one of the oldest in the history. So the combined age was even more than Batvinik Smyslov. So that, I think the, 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 there are certain inconsistencies with the development of chess. And uh, 
not that I'm a guardian of the game, but I feel very strongly in expressing my views uh, regarding the, this, this current, what I believe is crisis. If you look at your younger colleagues, the ones that you mentioned just now, and if you remember the games you played against Karpov, let's say in 84, 85, would you say they lack the present games, this sophistication, the beauty that was determining the games you were playing at the time? I mean, technically speaking, Ananda and Gelfand also my younger colleagues. colleagues. So I'm uh, uh, six, seven years older than... than, than sure. okay. No, five and six. Five years older than Gelfand, six years older than Ananda. But I started earlier. Uh, we, um, and so we have, I may consider myself a, a generation before them. So um, now the younger colleagues is those who are now in 20s and early 30s. Sure. Uh, but when I look at the game, let's say playing by Magnus Carlsen versus Levon Aronian, we take number one and number two in the, in, the, in the list, rating list. I would not say that the precision or the quality of the game is lower and, and the game is worse than one I played against Karpov. Um, we always are thinking about the old glorious days. Of course, in our old glorious days, things were better. In chess, we saw, unfortunately, we saw a decline. When I played Karpov or when Spassky played Fischer, that was a big story. Most likely, we had to attribute it to the political clash. Fischer, Spassky, Cold War, USSR, United States. It was more than chess. Kasparov, Karpov, all the new in the Soviet Union, perestroika, new thinking, uh, opening up. So. Chess hasn't managed to adjust to the modern world without this political background. That's why today you ask people, this audience I think qualified, but because we already talked about it, but in many audiences I could ask who is the world champion? And nobody will, will, will answer. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I remember that about, uh, actually this year I spoke at a very prominent business conference in Munich. There was a room, uh, it was about probably 50 people. And we're talking about a very prominent group you know, of senior vice presidents of the big corporations, uh, highly intelligent, and we talked about it. And I asked this question. There was silence, and then one hand raising it. I said, Vichy Anand? I said, wow. And the man looked Indian for me. He says, yes, he's my relative. <laughs> <laughs> So what happened to chess after it stopped being a big political event? No, I think the natural process could be for chess, and it should be, to become a game that has its you know, right place in this new environment, sports, culture, education, and we failed. Uh, you have to, in the modern world, you have to rely on the sponsorship. Sure. And the sponsorship depends on your ability to sell your story. So what is your story? We are not football, so, which doesn't have to sell anything. It's a number one game everywhere. <laughs> uh, we have to present a story. And unfortunately, the story of chess in the last 20 years was not very attractive. The way PD, uh, chess has been ruled by International Chess Federation, by uh, its president, Mr. Ilimzhinov, and also the conflicts surrounding the game, uh, they created an image that no corporations would like to touch. Mm -hmm. uh, just imagine today if you have a cor potential corporate sponsor that will Google the game of chess and it looks for in FIDE, International Chess Federation, and Ilum Zina. First things he will see will be aliens, the story of Mr. Ilum Zina meeting aliens, meeting Gaddafi, meeting Assad. What are the chances 
of Google's or Intel's or Coca-Cola's of this world even to touch it. Now, also, chess hasn't managed, and we all share this guilt, to find its, its spot you know, in, 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 in this big picture. I think we are very late in, in, in approaching this educational angle. I believe chess belongs to the classroom. And again, we don't have yet enough um, momentum in the world of chess to actually make it happen. Chess failed to earn its spot in, 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 in the cultural environment. All attempts were to make chess part of the sport uh, environment, uh, to become members of International Olympic Committee, full members, to go for this illusionary goal of getting funds from the local Olymp Olympic committees. Yeah, I, I think chess is a sport, but I think it's much more uh, complicated and, 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 and exciting rather than being just, just a narrow, narrow sport. And competing with physical sports is almost impossible. So chess had to find its, 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 its room, its, its, its place, you know, maybe at the nexus, at the, at the crossroad. I feel that now we, we have a chance of actually getting back and, 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 and making the right moves. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to, to use my old chess skills to help the game of chess in this, in this crucial moment. You know, in your book, you were describing how chess reflected the certain social atmosphere. Uh, you were describing the certain phrases that were used, like peasants are the soul of chess, mm. just before the French Revolution. Then you had the whole Botvinnik school that, mm. of course, had this Soviet science uh, spirit atmosphere. Then, of course, uh, Mr. Kasparov arrives with his bold moves that may be anticipated democratic chess. What about nowadays? What does chess reflect of the modern society that surrounds us? Uh, that's a, thank you it's, for the question. It's, very, it's, it's, it's a very good one because it, it reflects not only the fact that chess has been somehow lost because you mentioned not just chess reflecting a, a certain period. You always mention names of people who were behind the theory or uh, a concept, you know, like uh, François Philidor who came up with this you know, pawns or the souls of the game, or Batvinik, or you may talk about Tal or Karpov or Kasparov. Today, as we already discussed, there are no individuals that could be easily associated with current momentum. But that, that brings us to the second question, and what is the current momentum? Yeah. What is this, the current that's, the, momentum? that's the big issue. I think it's not only for chess, but also a question for the rest of the world. Uh, Unlike the periods of, let's say, 50s and 60s, USSR, Soviet Union, the Cold War, space race, big competition, two systems, huge expectations about the future, or then 80s, perestroika in the Soviet Union, collapse of the um, Eastern Bloc, Berlin Wall goes down, big expectations again. Today what? So what are the big expectations of, of tomorrow? What is the very distinct flavor of our time? I think this is the question that we all have to answer, and uh, so maybe it will help chess as well. But let me ask you a very, maybe, naive question. For instance, will you distinguish the chess that is being played by Anand, and for instance, chess that you, it's being played by you, or an American, or Bobby Fischer? Would you say that chess carries the cultural background of society where chess players no, come from? Absolutely, but uh, again... But what about nowadays, when society is over-globalized? I mean... Yeah, but it's the, it had an impact on the preparation, Again, we, we briefly touched computers, screens, and the chessboard. It's not an old-fashioned preparation when you have notebooks, you know, when you look at the chessboard, you move the pieces. Now it's all on the computer screen. So you just move, the, move, move, move your mouse or, you know, on the touch screen, use your finger. Today, any chess player, age 12, 13, who concentrates on the game of chess, he knows much more than Bobby Fischer knew 40 years ago. Which again is natural because obviously today any student or any teenager who, interest, who has interest in science knows much more than Einstein and Newton combined. So what? 
So that's the, it's, it's about amount of information available and also about your ability to, to retrieve the information from, from the database. Uh, but obviously the amount of knowledge we receive without any labor, because I remember when I had to collect information, uh, I had to go through, this note, through the magazines, I was treasuring the chess informator, you know, Yugoslavian chess informator. <laughs> you know, when I could look at the, the games played by great players, I was making notes. It took time for me to collect my little database, and I was very proud. Today, just you know, pushing one button, and it's, it's, it's there. I think it, it saves time, but it endangers creativity. You don't have to be that, that creative. So, whether you want it or not, there is an illusion that every answer is on the computer screen. And it's not, it's not only about chess players. You go to any business. Well, I propose we go back a little bit, a little bit back, back in, time. in time. Back in time, yeah. Then we will talk about Big Blue and uh, the rest of the things. That's also back in time. <laughs> it, that's correct. You were born in Baku, Azerbaijan, yes. to uh, Armenian mother yes. and father who, father who was Russian Jew, yeah? Okay, we may call Soviet Jew. So, it's so what does that make you? What do you call yourself? What are you? Armenian, Jewish, Russian? You used to be Soviet, that was easy at the time? Yeah, but it's the... Does no, it matter? The answer, the, answer is, the answer is very much, you know, it's part of nature of the Soviet state, which you may consider a, a successor of the Russian Empire. And as any empire it had, it, it, play, it, it played a role of a melting pot. So you had people um, uh, like me, uh, my family, in similar situations somewhere in the French Empire outside of France or a British Empire somewhere in India. So they came back, uh, you know, just carrying different ethnic mixtures they could belong to different ethnic origins, but at the end of the day, they were parts of, uh, of the same cultural language and historic environment. So Baku, unlike many other capitals of Soviet republics, for instance, Yerevan of Armenia or Tbilisi of Georgia, it was the, um, you may call it South, uh, Southern Imperial Outpost. It was a Russian-speaking city. Mm -hmm. So they were all the nationalities. They, uh, melted in, in, uh, in, 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 in what you may call the Soviet people, so people who spoke Russian and belonged to the same cultural matrix. So in my family, my mother's family, there were three daughters. My mother married a Jew, the second married an Armenian, the, the youngest married an Azeri. So that's why we just had, you know, the family and all cousins sure. who belonged to the same, you know, blood origin, we are quite different. And our kids, you know, uh, they, they don't even understand the nature of the question because they, are, they live in Moscow now. And when many people ask me, why did you move from Baku to Moscow? I said, I was born in the country where Moscow was a capital. And I still live in the country where Moscow is a capital. So I just, empire has shrunk as, you know, after collapse of British empire, many of those who believe the Brits moved from India to, 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 to the shores of the UK. Mm -hmm. um, um, by language, culture, education, by historic perspectives, I'm Russian. Also, I don't have a, a drop of Russian blood. Tell us, uh, Mr. Kasparov, how do you remember those old times of Soviet chess comparing to the modern chess atmosphere in Moscow, let's say, nowadays? Um, no, if, so my youth did not take place in Moscow, so I grew up in Baku and it was a different environment. So Moscow, I visited occasionally on the way to the foreign tournaments because, you know, you, at that time you couldn't fly outside of Soviet Union unless you, you uh, cross borders in, in the capital. Um, there is, it's, it's, there's always a temptation to say that those were much better days. And there are a number of reasons to say that because State was part. Uh, um, state was very um, paid a lot of attention to the game, so you could study the game. There were resources allocated to find Karpov, Kasparov, or other great players, and to make them great, to represent our country abroad. Um, 
but we are always guilty of trying to exaggerate the beauties of the past because we're young and there are many great things happening to us that are not going to happen now so and uh, I am always very cautious in giving these glorious assessments of the past because it was still Soviet Union it was still a communist dictatorship and if I could uh, enjoy certain benefits by being a great chess player I even I couldn't escape uh, the pressure of the regime when I began playing at a high level and was threatening carp of supremacy. Um, Tell us a little bit about that. What kind of pressures oh, it's, um, were there? You know, every system of that type, um, uh, every non-democratic uh, regime f fears to lose status quo. And I don't think that at the beginning of, of um, Kasparov Corp of uh, uh, tension, uh, even before we play the match, the Soviet authorities looked very much on my uh, ethnic origin. I don't think that was a big reason. Armenian Jewish, it was less important than the fact that Karpov was their guy. It's like a soldier of the party. And he was a great symbol of the stability, some may call stagnation of the regime. Uh, and uh, the words spoken by Brezhnev when he received him after Karpov won second match against Korchnoi, so he took the crown and keep it. That was very much you know, a signal to every bureaucrat. You know, you can't touch the status quo. But you were not very political at the time. Uh, the chess was no, I, 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 I would say until, you know, I didn't have much of illusions about Soviet Union, but uh, I grew up, you know, in the intellectual circles uh, in, in Baku, so I uh, had my, my father's relatives these Jewish intelligentsia, so I read enough books, you know, including Solzhenitsyn and others. Um, but at the same time, I had one goal, a narrow goal, to become the world champion. So, and I didn't want to do anything that could jeopardize it. So you have to join the Communist Party, you have to do that. So I didn't do anything that I should be ashamed of now, but uh, I didn't want to do at that time anything that could uh, totally throw me off the balance. Uh, now, in 84, 85, when I actually had the first collision with the system, I became much more political. And clearly in 1985, when I gave my interview to the Spiegel magazine, mm -hmm. Der Spiegel, uh, in Germany, sure. and that was the, uh, like a, you know, a bomb for Soviet authorities, uh, I just recognized that this fight with Karpov would go way beyond, you know, my attempts to change situation in the world of chess. Um, um, I still had hopes for maybe for a couple of years, 85, 86, maybe somehow 87, that under Gorbachev leadership, Soviet Union can um, go through this peaceful transition into this something more appropriate and, 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 and pleasant. But uh, then I just lost my hopes. I saw that Gorbachev wanted to preserve not exactly the status quo of Brezhnev's time, but still to preserve the regime. But where do you see the positive political forces in Russia? Today. Today. Is this the new...